Hi everyone, and welcome to Jubilee Church's online service. My name is Stephanie godwin Chu, and I'll be your host today. Romans 3 tells us that we all fall short of deserving the love of a perfect God. We have all been selfish, we have all been prideful, but the good news is we can be free of those things, we can be forgiven, and we can still experience God's love. If you know someone who needs to hear about the freedom Jesus has made available to us, this is a great time to click the link in the chat box and invite them to experience this service with you. Now I encourage you to participate with us, to engage with others online, and to sing as we reflect on the great things Jesus has done. Oh, the 
Hey everyone, it's so good to worship with you. In just a minute, I'm going to share with you how you can connect with Jubilee beyond this service. But right now, I want to make sure that you get this free gift if you are new with us today. Every week, we send these gift boxes out to those who are new to our services as a small way of thanking you for coming and telling you that we care. You can receive this gift by clicking the link in your chat box. We will connect with you and send you this free gift in the mail. Hey, Jubilee fam, today is a fantastic day because we get to welcome in some new members here in a minute. They're going to introduce themselves, but it's so good because God is adding to the family and and, and adding to the family. He's adding to our punch. He's adding to our mission. He's adding to our ministry. God is building a family. He is building a house, not made of brick and mortar, but lives, uh, putting lives together, uh, brought together by His Holy Spirit. So it's not brick upon brick, it's life upon life. Learning to be uh, interdependent and together of one heart and one mind. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that God does. And we want to celebrate that today. We want to celebrate what God is doing. And we want to celebrate these wonderful people. We believe that they have a gift and they are a gift to us. And uh, we have a part to play. We have an active part to play. It's not just him saying, hey, I want to be a member. But we have to actively receive them, which means we open them. We open them. We open our lives to them. We open our homes to them. Uh, We want to receive from them. We receive the gifts that they have to build us up and to strengthen us as well as as us giving gifts to them. So it's, it's all of us together. Um, Man, it's a beautiful thing that God's doing. God saves us individually, but he adds us into family and the family is getting bigger. So um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and then we will pray. Hey, Jubilee Church. Uh, We are Brian and Nalita Hurley. Uh, We moved uh, to the States about a year ago and we've been going to Jubilee Church ever since. Uh, And we are part of Ashley and Nolan's small group. And the reason we chose to become members of Jubilee Church is because we love the intentionality of the community, but we were also very attracted to the individual and community prayer life that the church has. We are so excited to become part of this church. Hi, we're the Griffith family. I'm Bryka. I'm Justin. I'm Parker. I'm Curry. I'm Marcus. And we started attending Jubilee Church in September, and we are part of Chad and Rachel Ray's community group. And we're becoming members of Jubilee so we can be a part of the active and growing family. Hello, Jubilee family. My name is Deshaun Porter. I've been coming here for four months. I enjoyed the atmosphere. I enjoyed the preaching and teaching. And I, I enjoyed making me feel welcome ever since I moved here to St. Louis. Thank you, Jubilee, for making me feel so welcome here. Hi, I'm Kim Ehrman, excited to become a member of Jubilee Church. I've been attending the city location since this summer and was really grateful for the warm welcome from the Schubert Community Group. Let's pray. Father, we are in awe of your plan, how you have saved us, Lord, that we were not um, friends of you. We were rebels. Uh, We were enemies of you, but out of your great love for us, you won us back by your blood. Jesus Christ, we thank you so much for your death, burial, and resurrection that makes this new life possible. And we thank you for family. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, without your Holy Spirit, Lord, we would never want to come together. But God, you have brought us together uh, by your blood. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that we would live lives worthy of the gospel, that we would hold on to the unity. And Lord, I just thank you for these precious people. I thank you for everyone at Jubilee Church. What an amazing thing, this family that you brought together for a purpose, to be a blessing to our cities and to our world. And we pray that you would do just that, Lord. We we pray that you would help us come together as a, a stronger and stronger family in your name. Amen. Well, hey, maybe you're new at Jubilee Church and you say, hey, I'd like to be a part of this. Uh, your next step is Growth Track. For more information about Growth Track, click the link in your chat box. Uh, we can get you more information and better yet, even get you signed up for the next course. In just a moment, Dr. Greg Nelson is going to speak to why every single one of us needs a savior. Take a moment and invite a friend to hear this powerful message. Let's first listen to the scripture reading for today. 
Today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 30. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is the word of the Lord. On April 15th, 1912, the RMS Titanic sank in the North Atlantic Ocean after striking a glancing blow across an iceberg. Long considered one of the deadliest maritime disasters in history, the story still captivates the minds and hearts of historians and laypersons alike. Not to mention that the dramatization in the motion picture from 1997 made $2.2 billion in the box office. That's billion with a B. Of all the pieces of the Titanic puzzle, the one that has left an indelible impression on our minds is the one we know the least about. The iceberg. That's right. Forget about Leonardo DiCaprio's meteoric rise or Kate Winslet's Oscar nomination or even James Cameron's Best Director Award. No, it's the icy villain who claimed 1,500 men women, and children that fateful April morning. That is the one that we've never forgotten. Who doesn't know the phrase, that's just the tip of the iceberg? And could it be that this idiom is seared into our minds because of that fateful and tragic voyage? And so we carry in our collective imaginations the proverbial iceberg. We all fear that something sinister could be lurking beneath the surface. Now, what does the Titanic have to do with today's scripture? Well, here is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, his uh, magnificent collection of teachings, best known for many of these verses that we will look at today. In these verses, Jesus changes the game on how preaching was done in his day. And he uses a rhetorical maneuver here that I like to refer to as iceberg apologetics. It begins with these two spiritual dangers that we can all recognize, murder and adultery. And then he proceeds to illuminate our minds to see not just the icy threat above water, but the dangers, the massively overlooked dangers that lurk beneath the surface. We thought steering clear of what we could see, the obvious obstacles, murder and adultery, would be enough. Enough to satisfy God's standard of righteousness. But after Jesus is finished, we will understand just how great the danger really is. Jesus opens this section with this phrase, you have heard that it was said. In verse 21, he references the sixth commandment, that is, you shall not murder. And in verse 27, the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Now, every Jewish person within earshot would have immediately recognized what Jesus was referring to here, these commandments. But the construction of Jesus' argument is fascinating, scandalous, actually. He, He says, you have heard it said, by whom exactly? Oh, yes, by God Almighty who wrote with his own finger on stone tablets handed down to Moses, our greatest prophet. That's who said it. You're right. We have heard it said, Jesus. And then Jesus goes on to say, 
God said this, but I say, seriously, Jesus? Now, Jesus was quite popular in his day. However, I'm sure that the idea of this new upstart itinerant preacher, fresh on the scene, with teachings that are rivaling God, rivaling the Ten Commandments, rivaling what Moses has taught us, well, that is ridiculous, scandalous, more surprising than anything you have read on Facebook or social media, Twitter or Reddit. You know, Jesus, you're pretty hot right now and all. Your book is like a New York Times bestseller and your podcast is number one on Spotify. Your TikTok videos are viral and you might have a million followers on Twitter, but are you really going to contradict God? Well, let's look a little bit more closely. Jesus' intention here is not to contradict God but instead to contradict our interpretation and our application, our understanding of what it means to make our way to God. You see, Jesus is upending the way that we use God's words because we, well, we are guilty of misusing him. Many in Jesus' day would have believed that fulfilling the Ten Commandments was the standard for acceptance by God a concept referred to as righteousness or having right standing with God. If I follow the rules, I can earn God's approval. And often this leads to other questions like how good is good enough or what's allowable and what's off limits or how bad can I be and still avoid punishment? You know, I see this with my children all the time. If I state a household rule, I usually get a question. I don't know if my children are just trying to test my resolve or simply looking for loopholes, but it never fails. If I say, sweetheart, no more sweets right now. I'm making dinner we're going to eat soon. Uh, The question I get will be something like this. Daddy, you said uh, no treats or sweets, but this granola bar, this is a snack. This isn't a treat. Or if I say hands are not for hitting, you guys need to calm down. They'll say something like, well, you know, if I use my foot, it's not really hitting, right? Well, already at ages four and six, they are skilled litigation attorneys. And despite my consternation, I I have to admit, this is something we all do all of the time. God said, thou shalt not murder. So we don't pull the trigger. We don't want to go to jail. I mean, God forbid, not us. We're good church folk We wouldn't do something like that. So we resort to more socially accepted methods. Anger, spite, vengeance. These things aren't murder. So mad at someone but don't want to go to prison? Find a way to get back at them. Ruin a relationship. Sabotage a career. Vandalize their property. Didn't Carrie Underwood have a song about scratching up some guy's pretty little souped-up four-wheel drive? Or have you ever seen the movie Mean Girls? or Riverdale, or anything on the CW for that matter. When the popular kids need to maintain their power and control, they don't resort to guns or violence. No, generally speaking, you spread a little gossip, assassinate their character, not their body. Or in in case anger is not your vice, let's consider Jesus' commentary on adultery. You shall not commit adultery is a a clear line drawn in the sand. No doubt, marital vows are sacred and the betrothal, the commitment, you know, the exclusivity of marriage should be respected. Ah, yes, but they do say it doesn't hurt to look. Maybe a little window shopping is your forte. So as sure as men and women have throughout every age broken their vows, so too men and women exercise those wandering eyes. But isn't this how every adulterous affair begins with a look? Sadly, many will entertain thoughts of uh, those who are not their spouse, believing naively that there's no harm done. Yet adultery grows from the seeds of lust, from selfish desire. And lust, mind you, always leaves its mark. Jesus, however, Jesus ain't pulling punches. Jesus will have none of this. He knows our true nature, that we're prone to run up to the line and test and to look, doing everything short of the limit. So he moves the line. 
Suddenly, Jesus expands the list of forbidden activities from the stone tablets, murder, and adultery to include now anger, insults, and wandering eyes. But why? Why are these seemingly innocuous activities now worthy of judgment, trial, and hellfire? Why are they so urgent that that we should be stopping in the middle of church to apologize or we should be gouging out our eyes to try to resist temptation? Let's look at verse 22. Jesus specifically addresses our speech. He says that those who would, in their anger, call their brother or sister Raka would be subject to the high court of the day. Most scholars believe this word Raka could be translated as empty-headed, an ancient equivalent to idiot. But more than suggesting someone's mind is uh, empty and devoid of common sense, it was a word of intense disrespect meant to assassinate character. I'm sure we can all remember a time when we either used language like this or received language like this. What an idiot! Ah! What were you thinking when you said that? in reference to a spouse, a friend, a sibling, a child, a coworker. In your heart, was there love, grace, kindness? Or was it malice and rage and vitriol? Were you looking to strengthen them, to build them up, to encourage them, or to tear them down, to wound them, to leave a mark? Or consider the gaze of desire, whether in person or through a screen. You know, long considered a a guy's problem, uh, one in three women now proudly admit to regular use of pornography. They call it exhilarating and empowering. No one even knows what we do in secret. But what is our motivation? Do we hope that the object of our desire would experience God's best in their life? That they would have freedom from entangling sin or forgiveness through Jesus? That the indwelling power of the Spirit would come upon them and give them victory to overcome life's challenges? Or in that moment, did we disregard their personhood and make them into an object of desire, less than human? Did we serve them in those midnight hours or did they serve us in our fantasy? You see, these are the submerged dangers, the ones that uh, if we aren't careful, we will unexpectedly run up against them and they will tear a hole in our lives and unwittingly sink our ship. We readily admit that murder is evil because it robs a person of their life, their hopes and of their dreams, but we fail to recognize that our gossip and our name calling is meant to maim them, to leave a mark and a wound in their soul. Likewise, we understand the collateral damage of divorce and marital unfaithfulness, tearing apart homes. But have we considered that our lustful looks and our objectifying fantasies not only strip people of their clothes, but also of their dignity. Maybe we think it's okay because there's no physical evidence left of the crime. You know, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. But to treat another person as an object of wrath or an object of lust is to dehumanize them. It is a sin against them and against their creator. With our words and our actions, we deny other people their place as beloved image bearers of God. And now we can start to see why it isn't a big leap to go from cursing to killing or looking to lusting and why Jesus so easily associates these lesser sins with these greater judgments. But Jesus isn't simply trying to warn us about harmful speech and wayward glances. There is an absolute urgency in his message. The morning's anger and the evening's lust are both clear and present dangers and we must face them head on. Look at me with verses 23 and 24. Jesus says, If we are submitting a gift at the altar, 
Presumably, this is a sacrifice of atonement for personal sin given to God. If we are bringing our gift to the altar and we remember that our brother or sister has something against us, has holding a grudge, that we should stop in the midst of our ritual and prioritize reconciliation and forgiveness with our brother and our sister. I find this so interesting. Jesus, you mean to tell me that if I'm worshiping God and if I am seeking God's forgiveness, but I realize that, you know, I got beef or someone's got beef with me, that I need to go work that out first? Absolutely. I should make it a priority to reconcile with my brother. And in fact, it appears here that Jesus is saying that the order needs to switch, that before I go and receive or seek forgiveness from God, we need to seek forgiveness from one another. I don't know if Jesus means specifically to elevate the importance of interpersonal reconciliation amongst God's people to the same level as our reconciliation with God, or simply to show that we're sincere. I mean, what could be more sincere, a greater proof or evidence of our sincerity than, God, I'm asking forgiveness. I have done everything that I can already to make it right here on earth. God, now I want to make it right in heaven. In this matter, it's clear that Jesus expects his followers to keep short accounts and to reconcile quickly. Remember, love keeps no record of wrongs. Best to square up your ledger too early rather than too late. And as for lust, well, Jesus' advice is even more drastic. Verse 29, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Really, Jesus? Self-mutilation? Now, judging from the number of one-eyed and one-handed Christians that I know, lustful looks and actions, eh, they must be fairly rare. Either that or we have a serious failure to take Jesus at his word. Well, first, why the urgency? As a surgeon, I'm thankful to say that the need for leg amputation is rare. A non-functional limb, severe trauma, or a life-threatening infection. I can tell you this. I have never recommended amputation lightly. So Jesus' suggestion that the solution to habitual sin would involve cutting off parts of our bodies should shock us. This text should drive us to take stock of our lives. And if we find there some entangling pattern of repetitive sin, we should be calling the great physician for an urgent consultation. Listen, when a patient shows up in the emergency room with a a flesh-eating bacteria and an advancing infection, the doctors don't take a long lunch break, you know, talk about last night's football game, You know, maybe what are you watching on Netflix these days? No, no, no. We run to the patient. We get straight to work. Either to save the leg or to sacrifice the leg in order to save the patient. Jesus expects our approach to habitual sin in our lives to be equally ruthless. Now, the good news is, practically speaking, The solution to the enslaving power of sin does not involve literally cutting off our body parts. Why not? Well, because frankly, my hand isn't the reason that I sin. Neither are my eyes. They may be tools in sin, but they are not the origin of sin. No, the root of sin lies in our hearts. Ever since the day when Adam and Eve doubted that God was sufficient to satisfy their hopes, their dreams, and their desires. We have been repeating this, rehearsing a lack of trust in God billions of times per day as we all satisfy our desires on our own terms apart from God. No, that problem lies in our hearts. A blind man with no hands can still indulge in forbidden pleasures, 
just like a man with no tongue can still curse you in his heart. So why then does Jesus make these wild and incendiary statements? Well, to drive home the point that there is urgency. Our failure to acknowledge these dangers keeps us in harm's way. Just as a failure to acknowledge the iceberg's underwater extent doomed those 1,500 people to die in icy and frigid death, it's obvious that a cautious approach and early course corrections could have saved the Titanic, could have brought all those people safely through the North Atlantic Ocean. But human pride in the unthinkable ship mixed with carelessness led to a rash of bad decisions with grave consequences. So before we deem ourselves to be unsinkable, let us heed the words of Jesus and make note of the dangers that lurk in the icy water. Are you feeling nervous yet? You know, last week Brian said that the Bible is not meant to affirm our humanity, but to frustrate it. Well, I would take it a step further. Jesus' standards here, they aren't just daunting. They are impossible. If we take him at his word, his moral demands aren't meant to empower us. They are meant to crush us. At least they're meant to crush our self-confidence. It was not uncommon for Jesus' hearers to ponder things like, if that's the case, then who can be saved? In fact, in Matthew 19, they say this exactly. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? This is an apt response to today's discourse as well. I must admit, in Jesus' crowd, there would have been all kinds of people, wealthy poor, people on the inside, people on the outside, the religious elite, and then the downcast and skeptics. Sometimes I respect skeptics, the skeptics who reject the teachings of Christianity even more than I respect the people who claim to believe those teachings. You see, many skeptics have read the words of Jesus and carefully considered them, and their assessment is, huh, it's ridiculous. No one can do that. No one could live like that. Many Christians, however, have heard the words of Jesus and their response has been, well, you know, if we just work a little harder, in fact, if you work harder like me, then you can get pretty close to what God's standard is. Well, which response to Jesus is more accurate? The skeptic. The skeptic has honestly engaged Jesus' words, and they have accurately acknowledged their own shortcoming. They see the gap between Jesus and themselves. Their problem is, in the end, that they pass judgment on the standard. The skeptic says this standard is flawed because no one can achieve it. In the skeptic's mind, the test needs to be changed, not the test taker. Ah, but the religious person believes that through greater effort, he or she can elevate themselves to God's standard. That was the Pharisee's problem. That a person looks at this, looks close to the solution, but is actually far off. The religious person has overestimated themselves and underestimated God. And that's a far more dangerous place to be. Learning to abandon hope and our ability to achieve God's standard is much harder. Like cutting off a limb. No wonder the scripture refers to this process as dying to self. That's the kind of prospect that might lead you to respond angrily. You're saying that, that all my effort is for nothing? Angry. Possibly angry enough to kill the messenger. Even if that messenger is God's own son. Both the skeptic and the religious person alike must come to understand that Jesus' goal in this sermon is to lead us first to despair, to despair of hope in ourselves, to give up hope that we can achieve God's standard on our own, and eventually 
to say who then can be saved. But after we have given up this hope that we could do it ourselves, our hearts are ready to receive Jesus' good news. Again, Matthew 19. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, and they asked, who then can be saved? But verse 26, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. That is the gospel. That is God's good news that he has made a way where there is no way. Three quick points of application, and then I'm out. Number one, receive. Number two, repent. Number three, replace. First, receive. All people, all cultures, all societies have fallen short of God's moral standard. None is righteous. No, not one. And instead of wasting our efforts to earn God's approval, to clean ourselves up, let us instead receive, let us receive the grace of God in the gift of Jesus Christ, the one who has fulfilled the commandments, who has fulfilled the law, who has completed the task. Once we have done that, God promises to deal with us as though we had lived the exemplary life that Jesus lived And all that takes is a simple prayer. Number two, repent. That is to turn away. Once we have accepted Jesus' righteousness on our behalf, we can acknowledge that these sins, these actions are massive icebergs. And that there is far more that meets the eye. Uncontrolled anger, anger, unbridled desire. These things can shipwreck our lives, even if they cannot separate us from God's love. And so we must act. We avoid malicious speech. We reconcile with those who are angry at us. We keep short accounts. We don't let bitterness take root. Likewise, we must train ourselves to be disciplined with our eyes and with our minds. Harboring desire in our hearts will poison our contentment. And fantasies are a gateway drug to infidelity. Third, replace In the place of these seemingly innocuous sins, let us pursue positive virtue. That is when we're tempted to say something negative, biting and hurtful, we hold our tongue. Now holding your tongue alone, that's neutral. That's not actually positive. So what can we do? We can actually choose to say good things, true things, speaking love and encouragement and grace, especially when we want to take those things away. It will break, da- break down the downward spiral of negative speech and negative emotions while we cut across it with God's truth. Ultimately, that is where the true battle lies, not in our mind or in our mouth, but in our heart. And by aligning our hearts with God's truth and speaking it, acting it, well, we can bring positive to displace the negative This is where the Spirit's power is made manifest. For the scripture says this, it says, the mind set on the flesh, that is sinful desire, is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And so it takes active engagement. As true Jesus followers, we can partner with the Holy Spirit by choosing how we will fill our minds and our mouths. By practicing godly speech and godly thoughts, we can become like God, living with a humble reliance on the Holy Spirit. That is the surest way to become what Jesus tells us that we are meant to be, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, a city on a hill. Before the throne, God above, a strong perfect plea a great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and breathes for me my name is graven on his hands my name is written on his heart I know that why
that you joined us for our online service today. I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes I feel really overwhelmed by uh, my shortcomings, by the uh, gap between what I can achieve and be and what Jesus says is God's standard. But I'm even more excited about the truth that Jesus Christ came himself to earth. He came to teach us how we had messed up God's revelation, how we had uh, made it about us and not about him, that he came and fulfilled the law and prophets, that he became a sacrifice for sin, and that he made a way to God. Earlier in my message, I mentioned that uh, we could enter into this relationship with Jesus and receive his blessings through a simple prayer. And if you've never prayed this prayer before, uh, I would love to pray this prayer with you now. Um, So all it takes is a simple admission of our shortcomings, a recognition of Jesus and who he is, and an expression of faith in his ability 
to achieve this for us. So I would invite you to pray with me again, even if you've prayed this prayer before, to renew your commitment and to ask for God's great grace and his help. Dear Father God, we do acknowledge that we have fallen short, that we uh, daily choose to make ourselves pleased or to uh, satisfy our desires on our own, apart from what you have revealed is the best life. Lord God, we acknowledge that we need a champion, a savior, someone who can do it for us because we cannot achieve this, live up to this. But we're so thankful that Jesus has done it. Jesus, we trust you. We place our faith in your ability to do these things, to take away our sin and to bring us to God. And we ask, dear God, that you would give us help, practical help in the form of your Holy Spirit every day to change us on the inside and to bring us forward to make us something new, make us into that community that you have called us to be. I hope that you prayed that prayer with me. And if you have prayed that for the first time, uh, we would love to hear from you. We ask you to reach out to us and let us know so we can connect with you and try to give you assistance and resources and support in your uh, journey with Jesus. Thanks so much.